Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, my teammates from CSBA who are listed up here. Uh, we, had, we had a great team and, uh, and, a, and a good day on Friday. And I also want to start uh, thank my colleagues from uh, AEI and from CNAS and from CSIS for participating uh, and, and for taking the time to, to be part of this exercise. Let me start with the strategic context in terms of what uh, our CSBA team was, was, was trying to do. Uh, fundamentally, we saw that uh, addressing America's fiscal predicament uh, and its implications for, DA, for DOD was really only one imperative that we faced. The other imperative that we saw was, was, was equally, if not even of greater importance, uh, was addressing growing weapons of mass destruction and anti-access and area denial challenges we face around the world. We did not see this as a strategic choice, but rather as a strategic necessity and an imperative if we want to remain in the superpower business. The key test for us, therefore, was as we evaluated the defense program, uh, was the extent to which uh, the forces that we were going to invest in, uh, would, how well they would perform in increasingly contested, non-permissive environments. We wanted to increase investments in those capabilities and forces that performed well in non-permissive environments, uh, while decreasing investments in those that did not. And our goal overall, uh, similar to, to what our colleagues at CNAS was doing, was trying to achieve a better high-low mix of capabilities and forces uh, across the joint force. In particular, see seeking a better balance between uh, combat strike power, range, survivability, and sustainability. So we wanted to ensure a strategic driven approach, that this wasn't just going to be a budget drill of, of going and cutting everything. So the first thing we did is actually said, what are we going to increase funding in? Uh, we start here with, uh, as, as Andy Krepinevich said, uh, a, a, little, uh, a little over $500 billion bogey across 10 years. We actually dug our hole a little deeper to start by trying to figure out where we were going to invest. And the big trade we were going to make is we said it's better to have a smaller force, that is, we're going to have less capacity, uh, but we're going to have uh, uh, capabilities that are better suited for the sorts of operating environments that we're going to face. Therefore, we gave priority to force shaping over force sizing. And we did our best to protect readiness uh, ac across uh, the exercise, both at the full uh, Budget Control Act sequestration level cuts as well as at half of that. Uh, but we failed uh, in terms of our ability to do that in, at the full BCA level of cuts. Um, the bottom line, we, in the full BCA, we traded personnel force structure and some readiness uh, for this expanded capability suite to address future challenges. At half BCA, we were able to buy back 100% of readiness, uh, albeit with a smaller force. And, and this box here really kind of outlines what some of those crown jewels are, capabilities that we thought would be most viable per, for projecting power uh, into contested environments um, and, and that we would place priority on as we went through the exercise. This next slide just gives you an overall sense of our rebalancing effort. And as you can see, we took the most risk uh, in the areas of personnel uh, and readiness as well as in our air capabilities. Uh, we did the most rebalancing in terms of air, sea, as well as uh, space, cyber, and communications. Now I'll unpack these categories and walk through some of the details. In terms of the air and sea categories, we traded uh, a lot of TAC air for, uh, long range for, uh, for uh, longer range and multi-mission air systems. And let me say up front, this is not just about air and, this and just about the Air Force, but this is, a, this is about air capabilities across all of the services. We ended up with a, a smaller force. Uh, we had about uh, 1,100 fewer aircraft overall, uh, but increases in stealthy fighters, unmanned, advanced unmanned systems, and, uh, and bombers. We accelerated the fielding of LRSB. Uh, we terminated a more counterterrorism-focused uh, Navy U-class program and initiated development of a multi-mission sea-based U-class program, better suited for A2AD environments. We retired legacy aircraft. Uh, both in terms of tactical aircraft uh, as well as our, as our B-1s, uh, and we maxed out munitions to the greatest extent possible. Enhanced bunker buster munitions, advanced elect war electronic warfare systems, high-powered microwave weapons that could go against multiple targets, and longer range both air-to-air -air and anti-ship weapons. We also developed a super inertial navigation system capability for navigation for, for uh, that would be a JDAM uh, add-on for later. 
And across the board, uh, again, as Bob was saying, we really tried to max out autonomy uh, for unmanned systems uh, that would be able to operate going beyond remotely piloted. In terms of sea capabilities, we tried to max out naval combat power uh, as opposed to the number of ships. Uh, so we weren't really focused on fleet size as a metric. That said, we ended up, we, um, more by happenstance, we ended up with a larger fleet size, going from about 285 ships today to about 300 under the full BCA cuts. Um, Big increases on the Navy side were in terms of combat logistics ships. We thought that this was a major hole in our, in our current fleet design. Um, Minesweepers, and we also added uh, submarines and UUVs. In terms of sea uh, investments, S&T investments, we put particular emphasis on directed energy systems as well as electromagnetic railguns. We retired all of our cruisers. We cut two aircraft carriers, and we, we also reduced the LCS by. With respect to uh, Army, Marine Corps, uh, and, and Special Operations Forces, we reduced Army force structure, uh, going from 65 down to 41 BCTs in total across both the active and reserve components, and our end strength was reduced, and Army end strength was reduced to 420,000 active component and 539 guard and reserves. We developed a new land-based capability for missile defense. When, with respect to the Marine Corps, we cut Marine Corps active component uh, uh, disproportionately. It was, it was least of all of the services, going from 182,000 to 177,000. We saw the Marine Corps as essentially an on-call 911 steady state force that would be immediately employable for crisis response. With respect to special operations forces, uh, we did not add or subtract any force structure in strength, but rather we focused on increasing soft capabilities and investments for persistent engagement, as well as increasing ca their capabilities for operations in denied environments. Uh, such capabilities included clandestine soft insertion from both the air and the undersea, a special communication system for operating in denied areas, as well as biometric identity masking, uh, tr uh, tagging, tracking, locating capabilities, and non-lethal weapons. With respect to space, uh, cyber capabilities, communications, as well as our strategic forces and logistics and basing, we made a big increase in terms of uh, cyber warfare capabilities, both for offense and defense, but we were biased in the direction of offense. Again, going back to the emphasis we wanted to place on uh, maximizing uh, combat power. We invested on the space side and protected SATCOM as well as non-GPS next generation navigation systems and increased space situational awareness. With respect to our strategic nuclear forces, uh, we developed an ICBM replacement, but uh, in the first uh, fit up under the full BCA amount, we reduced uh, ICBM, uh, the ICBM force by one wing. Uh, but we also in, uh, invested in uh, a B61 life extension replacement system. In terms of logistics and basing, uh, we, we placed emphasis on bare base dispersal, rapid runway repair kits, and increasing number of aircraft shelters, particularly in the Western Pacific. We also developed an uh, ability to uh, rearm vertical launch system tubes at sea, uh, and we uh, uh, were going to, in terms of infrastructure investment, uh, develop forward rearming stations. Like the other teams, we also invested in BRAC. This is an upfront bill, but we saw it was really critical to get our CONUS basing structure in line uh, for the future and to rationalize that structure. So personnel and readiness took the biggest hits, uh, arguably under, under the full BCA amount for us. We traded a military in strength, civilian personnel, and contract support for robust future capabilities. Overall, we reduced the total force by about 18%, going from uh, 3 million down to about 2.46 million, including civilians. We tried to protect readiness, and in fact, in the second uh, FIDIP under the full BCA, we restored full readiness. Under the, the half BCA scenario, the first thing we did was buy back readiness in total, and we also bought back all S&T. We doubled the, the uh, investments we were making in terms of logistics and basing uh, with an emphasis on the Western Pacific and the, or the Indo-Pacific region. And we also maxed out uh, a lot of the same capability priorities that we'd made under the full BCA in terms of air, sea, SOF, and other capabilities. In conclusion, uh, there are a couple, a couple key points. The first is that um, 
although I think everyone in this room would probably agree that further cuts in defense are undesirable, um, we saw in this exercise that they provided a forcing function in terms of how we thought about rebalancing uh, across the military. Nevertheless, at the full BCA cut, there was a significant, uh, 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 very significant reduction in readiness, and we thought that really would be unavoidable at that level of cuts. Uh, and we would encourage Congress to consider that as, as we think about uh, sequestration. Um, we saw that shifting from the full BCA to the half BCA amount allowed the teams to fully protect readiness uh, and to shift faster towards the development and fielding of some of the key capabilities that we outlined in the first move. Um, but again, and to footstomp uh, Bob's comments earlier, we really saw this as the best case that you could, that you could possibly end up with. Uh, if we don't have flexibility in terms of compensation practices and infrastructure and things like BRAC, uh, it would be much harder to uh, achieve this sort of rebalancing. Thank you.